Hello. Welcome everyone to Boston Sites Practitioner Education Series. My name is Laura Castle and I am the Director of Professional Affairs and Consultation with Boston Site. Uh, Boston Site is a nonprofit healthcare organization that advances the treatment of diseased or damaged corneas and dry eye. Our ongoing commitment to research and uh, technology have saved the sights of thousands of people around the world. Tonight, we are happy to have Dr. Karen Lee and Dr. Ariel Sorenzi present Smart Sight Managing Most HOA-Related Visual Complaints Without an Aberometer. And I am honored to introduce them to you. Dr. Karen Lee uh, received her Doctor of Optometry optometry degree from Indiana University School of Optometry and completed a cornea and contact lens residency at Southern California College of Optometry. Prior to joining the University of Houston as a clinical assistant professor, Dr. Lee served as uh, director of the specialty contact lens clinic at the University of California, San Francisco Ophthalmology Department. Dr. Lee is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and the Scleral Lens Education Society, past president of the Scleral Lens Education Society and GPL advisory board member. In her free time, she enjoys exploring Houston with her husband and her two sons. Dr. Ariel Sorenzi is a specialty lens and myopia management enthusiast. Her passion derived from witnessing the profound impact specialty contact lenses have on improving the current and future lives of patients. She cold started a practice called Charlotte Contact Lens Institute to focus on these specialties. The Charlotte Contact Lens Institute operates as a referral center for patients with anterior segment, dry eye, and myopia management needs. Dr. Sorenzi att attended optometry school at the University of Houston College of Optometry and completed a cornea and contact lens residency at the University of Missouri St. Louis College of Optometry. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and the Scleral Lens Education Society, and is a member of the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. Dr. Sorenzi loves spending time with her husband, James, her daughters, Sophie and Adeline, and her two needy dogs, Remy and Otis. She enjoys water skiing, mountain biking, weightlifting, and front porch weight surfing. Welcome, Dr. Lee and Dr. Sorenzi. Tonight, the stage is all yours. Thank you so much for the intro, Laura, and congratulations on your new role at Boston Site. I'm sure they're very excited to have you. I'm excited and to be here. <laughs> thank you to everybody that's with us tonight as well. We're going to just talk mm -hmm. about, um, sorry about that. We're just going to talk about in an intro to ocular aberrations, right? Now, in the ideal world, if our patients were perfect, the optical system of the human eye would be perfect as well. We'd all be emetropes, zero aberrations, 2015 vision for all, we'd all live happily ever after. In reality, however, the optical system really is not as ideal as we want it to be. Each component, like the tear film, pupil size, your intraocular lens, that can all affect the entering light rays. Ariel, can you help us understand what aberrations are just a little bit? Sure. So let's think about an aberration free eye and the eyes that would exist and we would have no jobs if they did exist. <laughs> um, that is an aberration free eye does not exist though. All eyes have at least some aberrations going on in them from either the cornea, um, the lens or other, other types of imperfections that can happen in the eye. So if we think about an aberration free eye, let's first think about light that's focused at optical infinity and there are parallel lights that enter the eye, go through the anterior and posterior surface of the cornea, the anterior and posterior surface of the lens through the media then they converge to a perfect point onto the retina. Mm -hmm. The point spread function, that PSF in the upper right corner, I circle it with my mouse, that's what it would look like if we had a perfect point of light focused on the retina. 
Then when that light leaves the eye, it would then form parallel light, uh, rays of light again. That would then show a planar wavefront because there are no aberrations. Now, conversely, with all eyes, there are going to be some aberrations. So as parallel light enters the eye, the light rays are focused at different points of the retina. And we can see this point spread function looks kind of like a smearing effect of that point source of light. And any deviation from that planar, that planar wave, um, that that planar source is going to be an aberration. And it kind of looks like a corneal topography. And the idea is kind of similar to where the colors represent where the light ends up either in front of or behind that uh, wavefront plane. Mm -hmm. We probably remember through optometry school seeing this Zernike polynomial and we probably forgot about it as soon as we graduated because we really just operate in this area here, the second order aberrations, where we are correcting defocus with plus and minus lenses, myopia and hypermetropia, and then astigmatism correction as well. So these are our second order aberrations, also known as low order aberrations. Anything after this are going to be our higher order aberrations. And that's those are that's refractive error that we cannot correct with spherosil correction. And we can see how those correspond to the point spread functions on the right, or what that light would look like once it hits the retina. So when we look at wavefront aberrometry on patients, the maps that we get are a combination of whatever aberrations they may have in the eye. So let's look at a normal eye. This would be, this is from my um, Pentacam AXL wave, and it gives me aberrometry reading on patients. And this is a, a normal eye. This is um, meaning that it doesn't have any ectasia or ocular disease. This is actually my husband's eye. Um, so we can see in the second order, so where we operate with our sphere and sill correction, that's where the majority of his aberrations are for the eye. And then when we look at our higher order aberrations, there's really limited amounts there. We can look over here where the total amount of aberrations is a root, root mean square. It's just a way to quantify all of those aberrations is 0.9 total for the eye. And the higher order aberrations account for about 0.1 of that. So his higher order aberrations count for about 12% of his overall amount of aberrations. And that's pretty normal in a normal eye. Higher order aberrations can account for up to 10 to 15% of the overall aberrations that enter that that uh, the eye has. So what I did here is I clicked this little button and put in just higher. I just wanted to show what higher aber orders only looks like for the sake of comparing it to a keratoconic eye, which I'm about to show you next. So let's kind of look in this, this box here where we see our third order aberrations and they're pretty low. I mean, we have 0 0.01, 0 0.027, so really low values. And then we compare that to an eye that has keratoconus it's quite a bit higher, significantly so. Mm -hmm. And then when we look at how, how much the higher order aberrations account for the total amount, it's about 22% of the higher order, order aberrations account for the total aberrations of the eye. So Karen, tell us a little bit about what, what cause higher order aberrations in, in eyes clinically. Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, if you are a specialty lens fitter, you will see that many of your patients who require specialty lenses have some sort of higher order aberrations. A uh, great example would be our patients who have cornea transplants, our post PK patients. So these patients usually have, you know, extreme visual distortion if we don't correct for it with contact lenses. And a lot of times I find that they have against the rule astigmatism and asymmetric astigmatism. So that culminates in larger amounts of coma than the normal patient. 
Also, like the pseudo fake patient right here on the bottom left hand corner, imagine just how different the light rays would be depending on if they went through that decentered IOL or if it went over the decentered IOL. And then, of course, up top, we have our typical keratoconic patients who may have some scarring. And our keratoconic patients actually um, are our most common scleral lens candidate. They are notorious for having increased amounts of coma and trefoil. And really, that all kind of results from that abnormal corneal surface. So this also explains why when we are performing retinoscopy, you will see irregular scissoring and that light just bounces back out at you like Ariel said, it's not coming back out planar, it's coming back out kind of scattered from the retina. And that's also why we can't really correct them with glasses. Oftentimes with our post-refractive patients, we see an increase in total wavefront aberrations. And of course, symptoms for these patients especially will vary largely and depend on pupil size. Under scotopic conditions, when the pupil tends to dilate, patients who have higher order aberrations that are significant, they might start to notice a decrease in vision quality. And they're gonna report to you like, the, the words are just smearing, the letters just aren't as clear. I'm afraid to drive at night because I'm seeing a lot of glare and halos from the headlights. Ariel, do you feel like you see these patients in your practice? all the time. And what's challenging is even when you fit them in a scleral lens and you think that you're just going to rock their world, you're going to change their life, they still sometimes have these symptoms. I mean, how often do you fit a patient into a scleral lens? They have a clear cornea, no scarring, their lens is nice and clear, and you can't get to 20-20. Does that happen to you often? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm always a undersell and like over deliver if I can type of person. So I'm like, this won't rock your world. It might help a little, uh, just kidding. But um, <laughs> also just like keeping in mind too, especially if it's a keratoconic patient, sometimes even when I order that first trial lens, because they're so used to fuzzy vision, it just kind of takes time to adapt to that lens and they come back and then like shockingly, they gain a few lines sometimes. Mm -hmm. For sure. And so what happens when patients are unable to achieve 2020, but maybe they pinhole to 2020 because there's not any disease um, opacifications that are preventing that, that vision? Um, we, we're neutralizing the front surface irregularities through that scleral lens and the fluid beneath that scleral lens. And then we're able to put the lower order aberration, so our spherosil correction into the scleral itself. But what's left is an irregular posterior corneal surface. So this is a patient I saw a couple of weeks ago, and you can only imagine how the kind of aberrations that that posterior surface of the cornea would, would cause. So I, you know, I feel pretty lucky that I'm able to quantify that with aberrometry. Um, what do you do in your practice, Dr. Lee? Do you, do you measure aber aberrometry on your patients? Um, you know, I mainly practice at the University of Houston through students. So a lot of times I may not have the time to get that done. And so if I don't, one thing that has been really interesting that one of our patients actually brought to our attention was he just started looking at a small little dot on his iPhone and he would close one eye, close the other eye, and then he would draw for us what that little dot looked like. And so in this example right here, he kind of just drew that for us. And you can see that single point source of light, he interprets it as three individual points almost in each eye. And there's almost like a hazy, you know, fuzziness that joins them all together. And again, if you can't quantify, this might be a fun way to just get their subjective opinion on what it looks like, or pull out your ret again and just ret over top of that scleral. If I see a lot of irregular scissoring coming back from that reflex, that's going to give me a pretty okay idea of whether or not my patient 
has decreased vision because of those higher order aberrations. Truthfully though, in reality, the gold standard method for quantifying higher order aberrations really is by using an aberrometer. There are multiple aberrometers on the market, but not all of them are compatible with wavefront guided scleral lens manufacturing. There's also a lot of barriers right now that are preventing wavefront guided scleral lenses from becoming mainstream. Aberrometers tend to be kind of expensive. And so patients don't always have the easiest access to that type of technology. Also, the process itself can be a little bit complicated and a little time consuming. I've been really fortunate to work at the University of Houston where we have the VOI research lab and the two just most brilliant PhD scientists who dedicate countless hours to designing wavefront guided lenses for patients. Now to some manufacturers, that type of production time and dedication might be considered a poor return on investment. And so, although I do think that wavefront guided scleral lenses may be the future, we just really need to streamline the process for now. So what can we do for the patient that's in our chair right now though, until this technology improves, right? The first thing I would always recommend is just optimize the fit of that lens. Make sure that you center it up to the best of your ability. From there, tease out the correct and correct the lower order aberrations. If there is residual sill, like Ariel said, incorporate that residual sill with the front surface torque. If your vision still appears slightly decreased, not matching with the pinhole VA, consider reaching for a secret weapon, which is incorporating front surface eccentricity. Essentially, all we're saying and the theory behind it is aspheric contact lenses just provide a more precise guidance of those light rays than spherical contact lenses, especially when we're in the marginal areas of the lens. And so again, that's what we think in theory, right? What do the studies actually show? Well, this paper attempts to answer that question. In this paper, they fit 56 eyes in 39 patients. They fit them in a scleral device. And during the fitting process, they showed them what their vision would look like if they increased the eccentricity. If the VA improved, then they would continue to increase that amount of front surface eccentricity in specific increments. And then they would finally stop once there was no more VA improvement. What we see here from their results is that out of the 56 eyes, they only incorporated eccentricity in 16 devices. So what that means is this secret weapon of modifying that front surface optics is not for everybody, right? There's going to be specific times when you try it on your patient and it's, aha, this does help just a little bit. And in the groups that they focused on, because there were four groups where it was keratoconus, ocular surface disease, um, post-LASIK ectasia, and um, post-transplants, they found that the greatest amount of higher order aberration masking occurred in your keratoconic group as much as 77.1%. So that's pretty good. Now, again, for those of you that don't have an aberrometer out there, we can kind of test this in clinic as well. So that same patient that kind of drew that point source of light for me, and he saw that single point source as three, I then took a diagnostic lens from the Boston Sight Fit set that had a um, front surface eccentricity one value, had him relook at that single point source. And now instead of seeing three, he drew one little dot and just like a fuzzy haze around it. And so from my point of view, even without an aberrometer, this kind of gives me an idea of maybe this is something I should try on him because I would think that seeing one dot is a little more convenient than seeing three in his case. Uh, it's a, uh, I know that this patient was a, uh, a doctor, but it sounds like an engineer for sure. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. I agree. Agree. <laughs> so, um, in order to, before utilizing technology, like front surface eccentricity, first things first is that we want to optimize the scleral lens fit. 
And what's great about the Boston site fit set is that there are built-in features that really help you have success from the start. And that is because this fit set is driven off of lots of clinical data. And Dr. Lee was actually, or is actually a, a pros provider. And she can tell us a little bit more about what in the world it means to have a, a data-driven design. That's a great question. So, um, you know, at the pros um, site or in Boston site, we kind of saw after analyzing 7,000 lenses or devices that were finalized for patients, they started to analyze what the landing zone looked like for those 7,000 lenses. And they started to see a little bit of a pattern where they noticed the right eye and the left eye are not perfectly interchangeable in terms of when you're fitting a diagnostic lens. Laterality really matters. And you will look in the fit set and you will see one side is for the right eye, one side is for the left. Other things they noticed was that these lenses, the four different meridians that were being finalized, they all kind of differ from each other slightly. So your diagnostic fit sets are already quadrant specific in nature. And one study they had actually found that when you started with the fit set, there was really little changes you needed to make to the landing zone to get a nicely um, evenly aligned lens on the eye. And so Ariel, looking at what is offered, right? We have a slightly larger fit set here and then a slightly smaller fit set here. If you had to pick one, which one would you pick? Or do you decide to just get both? I just got both. <laughs> You're so lucky. <laughs> uh, what about you? Did, do you have both? You know, I actually, I'm a little spoiled. So because I was a pros provider in the past, I think I have like four or five fit sets from Boston site. But <laughs> you know, for those of you out there, I really think you have to look and see what type of patients you're seeing um, because there's definitely pros and cons to each of the fit sets. And we're going to go over that in just a second. Yeah. So for my, my patient population, I felt that it was best to, to have both. And in fact, last week I had a patient that I used one lens from each fit set. I used one from the large diameter and then one from the small, and I'll, I'll walk you through why Ooh. these were her topographies here. And her right eye had a K max of 105. Um, her left eye was somewhere around a, a 58, obviously a ectatic cornea. Mm -hmm. So that right eye is going to require a lens with pretty high sag. And I didn't want that really high sagittal depth that we'll have of that lens to put a bunch of weight on the sclera and, um, cause discomfort and complications related to the periphery of the lens. So I wanted to go with a larger diameter for that eye for sure. The issue was, is that this patient was in her mid fifties, had never worn contacts before and was absolutely terrified of contacts. So I know that if I was to get out a 19 millimeter lens, she probably would have like ran out of my clinic. <laughs> um, so you know, when I was putting lenses on her, her eyelids were squeezing shut. She was like hyperventilating when we were doing it. So mm -hmm. I just kind of thought about those things and said, okay, well, within this larger diameter, I'm going to start with the smallest of the large diameter that I have and then start with a, you know, maybe like a 16.5 in the left and just kind of ease her into scleral lens wear as much as possible while still having a, a great fit. Mm -hmm. And so these are, these are general recommendations for these particular fit sets for the, the 16, 16, five and 17 O fit set. Generally it's therefore small, smaller eyes. So small HVID pediatric patients that have smaller eyes, small apertures, tight lids, like for my patient difficulty handling lenses and then regular corneas that might need sclerals just for high refractive error. But again, these are general guidelines. You you know your patients best, just kind of how I walked through that particular um, patient encounter. And for large, the larger fit set, general recommendations are for larger eyes, 
large HBIDs, also compromised eyes, really dry eyes, um, and then highly ectatic corneas where they're going to be really steep, maybe those proud graphs, for example. Mm -hmm. So let's navigate through the, the fit set. This is the larger one here. You'll see some different colors here and they mean something. So first let's look at these um, nine lenses. Where did my mouse go? Can you see my mouse? Mm -mm. Oh, oh yes. yeah, there it is. <laughs> so these teal lenses, after you pick your diameter is really where you want to start. That's the scleral profile that that worked the best and all of that clinically driven data that that they designed these lenses after. Mm -hmm. And these nine lenses all have a power of about a plus a quarter base curve or not about they have a power of a plus a quarter base curve of eight millimeters and built in front surface eccentricity one. So you would start with the teal lenses in the center here. And don't worry, we'll, we'll talk about all of these other lenses in a moment. So let's say that you select your diameter, you start with that teal lens, and the lens is just too loose. Well, if that's the case, you can just pop over to the gray ones on your right and go to a steeper scleral profile and that profile is changed in a quadrant specific manner. Mm -hmm. Then if it's too tight, oops, then you would go to more of a flat distribution and just move directly to your left within the fit set. And then if you need to make any modifications from there within your fit connect um, software, which we'll look at in a bit, you can modify those quadrants um, in a quadrant specific manner. So that's, it's very highly customizable. Mm -hmm. So, so one, oh, mm -hmm. sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, I was going to say, you know, one thing to keep in mind as you go through this fit set is to make sure before we start to assess the landing zone, just be happy with your SAG. So if you kind of look at that boxes, those three boxes that just showed up, you'll see when we go from the teal to the grays, those all have the same amount of sag. If for some reason though, you feel like this lens is touching the cornea, it's teeter-tottering on this cone, it's making my landing zone look falsely elevated or falsely flat. If you look to the right, you will see that there's a additional lens in that same diameter but it's 400 microns taller than all the other lenses to the left. And so sometimes just by clearing that cone and having a decent amount of clearance there that's appropriate, that can allow the landing zone to just align a little bit more nicely. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> so what about that. those gray? What about those gray lenses? What are those what do those guys mean? So the gray lenses, that's a really good question. So if we look at all the lenses on the left, you will see they all say FSE1. So these are actually proprietary values, again, driven by clinical data. They looked at the eccentricities that they were building into those 7,000 lenses. The most common eccentricity that they used was built into these diagnostic lenses as FSE1. However, there's gonna be times where you see patients and maybe they just have dry eye or ocular surface disease, and they might not necessarily need that increase in asphericity. Well, you have a lens there that says FSE zero. That means there's zero eccentricity. That lens is just spherical in this optical zone. Now, for your patients where you fit them with the traditional diagnostic lens, and maybe they have a lot of irregularity, maybe that's Ariel's patient with that 105 um, diopter cornea, and you wonder to yourself, can I improve their vision further by increasing the eccentricity? Well, you have that S FSE2 lens there that you can put on, perform an over a fraction, and check VAs. Now, with the clinically driven data, though, and the automatically built in amount of eccentricity in the diagnostic lenses, what they have found is that. 90% of 
their patients that were fit in this lens actually had optimal vision and all from just changing that front surface eccentricity. And again, 90% using just the diagnostic lenses that are already in the fit set that you don't have to make any changes to. Now, should you decide that you want to change that eccentricity, that's when you would go into Fit Connect, or you could call Laura and she'd be happy to help you. And you would, you know, tell them, hey, I'm changing it. I'm not using the eccentricity one I actually over refracted with the FSE zero or the FSE two, or you could use the pull down and select which one it is. And then they will easily incorporate that into your lens that you ordered. So Ariel, do you feel like you use this technology much at all in your practice? I do. Now, I actually had a patient today that I did not fit into this and she was complaining about ghosting and, you know, shadowing. And I was like, dang it, I should have put her in the faucet cyclist. Yeah. Um, but it's so nice because in the fitting process, you know, if you, you see that you have a beautifully fit lens and maybe their vision just isn't quite right, you can throw on that that corresponding lens with the FSC zero or two, and it's not going to change your fit at all. And you just can quickly assess the vision. It's so nice to, to quickly do that without having any complicated aberrometry measurements. Um, it's not, it doesn't cost any extra to have that feature. And I mean, this is really cool, innovative technology that isn't provided by any other, um, any other fit set or any other, you know, lens that, that you can have, unless mm -hmm. you get into the more complicated stuff of the, the higher order aberrations. Yeah. So let's go over a few cases. I just wanted to start off with two cases where I don't really use an aberrometer just because again, I don't always have time, but case one for me was just a 30 year old um, surgeon who came in he just wanted a second opinion on his sclerals. He was actually seeing great out of them, like 2015, but he complained of like a streaking and he just wasn't that happy with the vision. Normally, if someone is seeing 2015, I wouldn't change anything. I would be like, this is very good. You should be happy with this. Um, however, given his occupation and truly it can be life or death because he's operating on people, I was like, okay, let's just try it. Um, outside of the vision, other things he reported are just a little bit of redness towards the end of the day, and it kind of gets a little bit uncomfortable. And so, you know, one easy thing to try was we maybe just don't change anything, just incorporate that eccentricity and see what happens. Well, actually, when we up the eccentricity, even though he's keratoconic, he felt his vision was worse. And I'm like, huh, why did it, why did that happen? So let's just take a step back. And let's just follow the rules that we kind of talked about, right? And so let's take a deeper dive and look at the lens he's currently wearing. It's 16 millimeter lens, spherical power, plus 150. So it doesn't really matter if it rotates on the eye, right? And there's a spherical back surface. When I'm looking at the assessment of the lens, I can see 150 microns clearance in the middle, post settling, that's great, love that. The limbal clearance is slightly limited. And then he does have that like, you know, meridional grade two plus blanching that's happening at three and nine. And so our first rule was to optimize the fit. So let's improve the fit if we can. The only things I changed were I um, increased the limbal clearance. I added a 200 micron back surface toric. I didn't change the power at all because there was no over refraction to incorporate. And through this first lens, he was 2020 minus. So wah, wah, not very happy, but he said that it was more comfortable and his eye did not get as red as he wore the lens. And that landing zone just looked a lot more aligned. From there, one interesting thing that happened was when I then took um, an over refraction now I'm finding residual astigmatism that's actually showing through. So instead of having a Plano over refraction, I'm seeing Plano minus 75, axis 95. And his vision through that lens was actually, through that over refraction, excuse me, was actually 2015 and he was quite happy. And um, a lot of the ghosting disappeared. And so I would say before 
doing anything like incorporating eccentricity, optimize that fit first. Because again, from that study, um, 16 lenses out of 59 truly felt eccentricity helped vision. This is one of those patients where it's probably just not the case. If we move on to case number two, we kind of oh, see here. Oh, it's okay. You did all that off of memorization. You're so smart. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's okay. I mean, it's one of my favorite patients, so it's fine. Um, if we move on to case number two, uh, this is a 35-year-old Hispanic female. Um, she was brand new to us. She came in for a full eye exam. She wanted to see better, like all our patients, right? She was already wearing a scleral lens, but she reported discomfort at the end of the day. And so her right eye, she actually had a transplant done, a full thickness transplant done in 2016. And then the left eye, she had, you know, the typical signs of severe keratoconus. We knew nothing about the lenses that she was wearing, but we did take VAs 2040 minus in the right eye and 2030 minus in the left eye. And so if I'm starting a fit from scratch, I will open my fit set. And then I notice that the laterality is there. Everything on the left-hand side of your screen is lenses designed for the right eye. And then everything on the other side is designed for the left eye. And so I just start with my teal. I move to the grays as needed. For her, she kind of looked best in a 19 millimeter lens with a 3,400 micron sagittal depth. And of course, that natural built-in FSE1 um, optics. From there, we ordered those lenses and we, um, actually, no, sorry. We put the diagnostic lenses on. I'm jumping ahead of myself. And we kind of looked at the fit and all of that. And so we can see the right eye, she had around 150 microns of clearance. Limbal clearance looked quite good, nasal and temporal. A little bit of blanching in Meridian 1. And you will see in these diagnostic lenses and in your patient's actual lenses, there's little laser etchings, one, two, three, four. And that just lets you know which meridian you're actually looking at. So you can make changes accordingly in the program. And so with an over a fraction, just spherical minus one, got her down to 20, 20 minus in the right eye. The left eye though, she had a little bit more clear and centrally. Her limbal clearance looked pretty good again. And then for the most part, haptic alignment 360. The over a fraction, not so great. A plus 50 kind of gets her to 20, 30-ish. And so we're going to just be mindful of that. We order those diagnostic lenses. The only thing I really changed for the right eye was incorporate that over a fraction. For Meridian 1, I went ahead and flattened it slightly. I added about 100 microns there. Over a fraction ended up being Plano in this lens, and she was seeing 20, 20. The left eye, we did that over refraction. I didn't really change anything about the landing zone or the limbal area. Still though, vision, not great, 2030. And when we pinhole her, she's 2020 minus two. I tease that eye looking for some type of over refraction. Everything is Plano, just no real improvement. And so from there, I don't change the right eye at all. She's happy, she's 2020. This left eye, the only thing I did was let's attempt to increase that eccentricity. Because again, this left eye is the severely keratoconic eye. The right eye was the post-PK eye. And so when we up that eccentricity from FSE1 to FSE2, that actually got her to 2020 minus two. And so I didn't really use aberrometry on her. And it's if you have that lens there in that fit set, and you're wondering if you can improve their vision, it's worth the time to just put that diagnostic lens on with an FSE2 and just attempt a quick over refraction. Because I feel like I could have saved her probably two or three weeks of um, time coming into the office. That's an awesome case. I love that one. Thank you. So this is a patient of mine. He was a 53-year-old African-American male that came in to my new practice the first, I guess, the first week that I was open. Um, he was already in scleral contact lenses, had a PKP in the right eye, moderate keratoconus in the left, really happy with his vision. 
Um, he shared a story with me that he was removed from his um, vehicle insurance because he hit his wife's car twice in the parking lot and his daughter's car three times in the parking lot before he was prescribed sclerals and so these have changed my life. You know, the only thing if I had to complain about them is my eyes get really red after I remove them. So I looked at the lenses on him and you can see um, first his vision was was great. 20, 20 minus two in both eyes. Um, but when you look at this lens, it's we'll see in a little bit. This is a really proud graph. Um and we have this engorgement out here in this landing zone. It's taking a lot of weight from this from this lens. So mm -hmm. it's no wonder that when he removes these lenses, he's going to have some rebound redness afterwards. So I pulled out my handy dandy Boston Sight Fit Set, and I selected for the right lens this 19 millimeter first because I knew that graft was a really proud graft, and I wanted to have um, a lens that would, that would take that weight well. So I selected this one with the FSC one. And then for the left eye, I selected the 18 millimeter, um, at the bottom, just with our standard scleral profile. And so these are the trial lenses on his eyes. And you can see that this is a better fit in these trial lenses than what he had when he came in with his finalized pair. I mean, significantly better. And when I over refracted him, he was amazed with his vision. He said, you know, I, I felt like my vision was really good before, but this is really HD vision. So that was really, that was really great to see. Um, you can see how steep that, that, uh, or how proud that graft was. And this lens and just the trial set is just handling it so well. We're not seeing any blanching or impingement of those of those edges and he felt great in them. I really only made a very small modification to a quadrant in in his right eye and that's really about it. So I was curious what his aberrations looked like in his in his previous lenses versus these that incorporated the front surface eccentricity. So first we can look at what his eye looks like without scleral lenses. So this is really the same data that I showed you guys earlier with the bars, but now it's just kind of in a pretty Zernike <laughs> pyramid here. Mm -hmm. uh, but just to orient you all, this is where we operate mostly with our spherosil um, correction. And then these are our higher order aberrations as we go from third order and down. So for his low order aberrations, that's our spherosil correction. You can see his refract his AR um yeah, minus five with minus five diopters of sill. Um, and then his higher orbit aber aberrations were a 0.921. Well, when we look at his presenting scleral lens, as we would expect, as that lens is sitting on the eye and we have the fluid underneath, it's masking a lot of those front surface irregularities. Um, this is his keratoconic eye, by the way, not the, the graft. So you can see from his uh, naked eye to the presenting scleral, the higher orbit aberrations decreased significantly. And then obviously the lower did too, because he didn't really have much of a over refraction need over those presenting sclerals. So then I looked at aberrometry over his trial lenses. So since these were trial lenses, we did need to add a little bit of a refraction in there. So we can kind of ignore this um, lower aber lower order aberration, but you can see that his higher order aberration aberrations went down even further in these lenses. And numerically, it doesn't look like a ton, but subjectively, he experienced a lot better vision than than what he presented with. Mm -hmm. That was a really cool case to, to just be able to quantify the difference between his presenting lenses without front surface eccentricity and adding that front surface eccentricity in. But you certainly don't need an aberrometer to, to be able to do that. As Dr. Lee mentioned, really just pay attention to their, to their symptoms, um, looking at things like pinhole 
and um, whipping out your retina scope. Those are all ways that we can determine if um, FSC technology changes would be warranted. Mm -hmm. So we have all of these within at the at our fingertips. We have these various diameters available. We have quadrant specific changes. We have these data driven designs that really can be customized in any which way that we want. And now we have this amazing, you know, front surface eccentricity optics at our at our fingertips as well. If you have scleral topography uh, within the portfolio, it's also something called the Smart 360 lens, which is a free form design. So I'm going to let you drive it drive it home, Karen. Yeah. So with the fit set, I I would say again, let's just remember to optimize the fit. Thankfully, as we saw with Ariel's patient, because those landing zones are clinically um, driven by clinical data, those 7,000 lenses they analyze, usually that first diagnostic lens you put on looks pretty good if that central clearance is appropriate. From there, if you think you need to optimize the vision further, you know, consider the FSE zero for your patients that have a more normal shaped cornea that might not have as many aberrations, or if it's a very highly irregular cornea, consider increasing that um, in eccentricity from FSE one to an FSE two using those two lenses in your diagnostic fit set. And again, you know, just thank you all for coming today. And of course, thank you to Laura and Boston side and Ariel for spending their night with us here this Tuesday. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys. Yes. And thank you, Dr. Lee and Dr. Sorenzi. It was a great lecture, a lot of great information for everybody attending tonight and how to manage these higher order aberrations in their patients. Um, we do have uh, a few minutes here to answer some questions. Um, we won't be able to get to everybody's questions, so uh, we will be sending out a follow-up email after tonight's uh, presentation uh, to answer those questions. And also uh, to let you know, we have been recording this uh, webinar, so we will have a recording of this webinar too, so you can refer back to it into the future. Um, so um, this question is to both of you. Okay, so you can answer independently, of course. Um, in your own words, how has having the option of adding or changing FSC impacted your scleral lens journey when it comes to your anastasia patient? I'll let you go ahead, Karen. So for me, I do feel like it is a little bit of a problem solver to have that ability there. Does it work every single time? No. But when it does work, I feel like it is quite impactful. And then oftentimes too, what you could consider, right, is should you try that FSE2 and it doesn't improve and you want to tackle it further, then you could consider potentially incorporating wavefront guided sclerals, which is something that Boston Site does offer as well. You just want to make sure that you have the correct aberrometers so that they communicate with the lab. For sure. Yeah, I agree. And um, one of the things that I like to, to do when I'm fitting this lens is really brag on the technology that's available in these lenses and just say, you know, this, this technology is unique to any other scleral lens that's, that's out there. And you're, you're in the best of the best types of um, type of optics that are available for your, for your eye. Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you. Um, we also have another question about how to measure VVID uh, with the two topographers uh, and to get the accuracy, is that more accurate than like say a ruler? And uh, how do you go about that? So the question was, how do we measure VVID, vertical visible iris diameter? I think I'm kind of old school because I trust my ruler more than I trust the topographer sometimes. I mean, you guys have seen in office, your patient comes in, their cone is so protrusive, the machine doesn't even want to get a reading for you. How reliable is it, right? 
And so for me, I've kind of adopted this um, old school method where I take the ruler and to try to make it more accurate, I hold it as close to your patient's central cornea. So if I'm doing horizontal, go this way. If I'm doing vertical, go this way. I get it as close to their eye as possible, center it up as well as I can, take my phone and I snap a picture of it. And so once I get that picture, then I can actually count the little tick marks off my phone screen. And I feel like that's more accurate for me when I'm struggling in clinic. Mm -hmm. okay. I like to use my um, slit lamp beam and mine goes up to 12 millimeters. So it helps me in, in 0 0.1 degree or 0 0.1 millimeter increments. So that's what I like to do. If, if it's over 12, then um, I'll use a ruler as well. I'm probably not as good as measuring it as Dr. Lee is though. Very good. And then as far as pleural lens uh, centration, um, how would you go about improving the centration of a lens uh, with the Boston pleural? Okay. So how would we improve the centration of a lens? There's two things that you have to think about. Sometimes, again, if the sag is way too high, that could cause the lens to be really heavy. Think of it like a beer belly because that clearance, that tear reservoir is just holding so much liquid and that will pull the lens down. Um, if you have a decentered lens, take your finger and manually center it by pushing that lens and just nudge it up with that through that lower lid. Look at that central clearance. If it looks adequate, then you have to tackle your landing zone a little bit. And that's where you're going to have to, you know, pay attention to if the lens is moving a lot or if it's very tight on the eye. And then which meridians are you changing and by how much are you changing? And of course, you can rely on your consultants too. Like I send Laura pictures and videos all the time when I'm stumped and she's able to help me. Very yeah, and when you... If, if it's not centered, those edges can be so misleading because if it's kind of, you know, pulling down, then maybe, maybe your edges look too tight because of the way it's weighed down and you might actually need, need to steepen them more. So, um, echoing what Dr. Lee said, it's so important to center up those lenses and see what you need to modify from there. Mm -hmm. Right. And on that, would you encourage people after they do their assessment on the spiral lens to remove the lens and look for any stain um, after that? And what's the benefit of that? For sure. You uh, don't know what you're not seeing until you look for it. Um, so you can see any sort of, you know, bearing that. I'm maybe. so sorry. <laughs> My two boys just stormed in here. Hold on. Let me find my, <laughs> oh my it should be. Um, so if you have staining in certain areas, you can look for, um, bearing of the lens on that area. Um, you know, uh, one thing that happened to me when I was a wee third year was I was, I was wearing scleral lenses and I filled my lenses with bio true and, my lens, my fit looked amazing, but when Dr. Walker took my lenses off, I lit up like a Christmas tree and she was like, what are you using for your filling solution? So you can just uncover so many things, um, underneath that, that scleral lens that you wouldn't know you're missing until you take it off and put some of those vital dyes on. Hi all. Sorry about that. Now I know how that CNN guy felt when his kid stormed in and the wife like, <laughs> <laughs> My husband just did it. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. That's Any real other world. questions, Laura? No, I think that is everything. Um, as I said, you know, we want to be um, mindful of everybody's time tonight. And uh, we do appreciate everybody joining us tonight to listen to Dr. Uh, Lee and Dr. Sorenzi talk about um, higher work graduations. We appreciate you guys coming in tonight. Um, like I said, great to see you. And um, for everybody else, um, please join us um, on our global community where you can share and engage um, with other practitioners and eye care professionals on fitting 
the Boston Sites plural. Um, and then also follow us on our Instagram and Facebook and social media pages. Um, see updates on what's going on with Boston Site. So with that, we will go ahead and close up tonight. Again, thank you so much. And thank you for everybody for joining us tonight. All right. Thank you, guys. Good night, everyone. Good night.